All right. Thank you, Craig. That was spirited and informative. Thank you so much. All right, Joe, you're, you're up. I'd like to introduce to the podium Joe Sharkey, who is going to be speaking on the special considerations for meeting the dietary needs of vulnerable groups. Joe hails from Texas A&M School of Public Health, and I will just make a quick announcement that we're changing the format a little bit as Joe needs to spirit off to catch a flight. So I'll be taking a couple of questions, just two, after his talk. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. And following, following Craig, it's like you're going from high energy to no energy. <laughs> and I've never, you know, that's not ever been my, that's not ever been my situation, but there is no way I can, I can uh, reach that bar. Uh, uh, but, but, but Craig did set, did, did set a lot of the context, and, and, and Julie likewise. And so what I've been tasked to do is really talk about special considerations uh, with vulnerable populations. So let's think about who do we consider vulnerable. And this is by, by no means all the groups or all the types of groups to consider. But I just put up, you know, those that are un, unrepresented. Uh, those, uh, folks who live in underserved communities, whether they be uh, rural communities or functionally rural communities, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, immigrant groups, and what we're going to start seeing more and more of now are going to be refugee populations. And, uh, and uh, this will be all part of the vulnerable groups that we'll see. The focus of my, of my work and, and my perspective uh, for today really comes from the years of work that we've done along the lower Rio Grande border of Texas with Mexico. And in particular, it's the challenges to nutrition that are, that are faced by uh, seniors in, in these areas. Uh, recently, our work has, uh, has expanded to include southern New Mexico and also Arizona through the support of uh, the USDA NEFA program, which is more of a fa uh, family-centered approach. But in these areas, we're really thinking about populations that have been marginalized. And not only have they been marginalized as a group, but the communities are impoverished. And uh, and, and so my focus is really on, on areas that we refer to as colonias, uh, or Spanish for neighborhoods. Uh, and, and these are, are really, are really some, of the, some of the reasons why, uh, why uh, the colonias are important. Uh, there's a national health epidemic of non-communicable diseases, and we see the numbers off the charts along the border. Persistent food insecurity and hunger not just, a, not just episodic, not just chronic, but persistent food insecurity and hunger, to where with hunger alone, we've measured over the years as much as 26% of, uh, of the population have, ex ha have experienced hunger. Locational disadvantage. This means lack of geographic access to places to purchase uh, uh, foods, foods and beverages. It's even lack of accesses, uh, lack of uh, access to senior centers, lack of access to other, ty other types of services. This is a population that's hard to reach and is underrepresented. Most of the national studies that you look at do not include this population. And part of the reason is mistrust. They are not going to answer the surveys that are asked. And it's incredibly difficult uh, uh, to, uh, to, reach, uh, to reach the populations. There are structural and contextual challenges. And, and I think also it's a consideration that this really is somewhat of an archetype for these new destination communities that we're seeing throughout the United States, whether they're in North Carolina, Tennessee, Iowa, Oregon, uh, or, or Washington. Some of the housing that, uh, that, uh, that, we, that we see. But the focus that I, that I really want to take is really thinking about how complex this whole idea is on, on meeting dietary needs. And so the first part I'm going to present is really thinking about resources. And Julie, and Julie uh, uh, talked about uh, the, the importance of resources and how we think about it. And I present this as kind of an initial approach to where we, when we think about uh, economic resources, we're thinking about adequate, uh, adequate financial resources. Uh, how long do the benefits last? Employment, financial management, competing demands. When we think about community resources, it could be transportation systems, it could be neighbors, it could be access and availability to different types of uh, food stores and food service places. It's not just the 
presence of nutrition assistance programs, but it's utilization. How much are they really, are they really being uh, utilized? It's other food uh, programs, and most importantly, it's community collaborations. Uh, with family, uh, we're thinking about relatives. Household composition, we're seeing all different forms of, of uh, household composition, whether it's uh, uh, living alone, living with an adult child, taking care of a spouse, living with uh, grandchildren, living with other, with, uh, other family members. And, it, and, it's, and it's thinking about within that context of family, what type of food sharing goes on within the household and how is food distributed uh, within, uh, within the household. Uh, and then finally with individual, we think about the household environment. Is there adequate storage? Are there cooking facilities? Can you keep food safe? Uh, uh, how, how, what, what other types of strategies are there? Thinking about knowledge, uh, skills, uh, individual capacity. But that's the resources as we think, as we normally think, think about this. But what we don't take into consideration and what I submit most of our programs don't take into consideration are the contextual domains. That it's not just the resources, but it's thinking about this overlay of contextual domains. So for example, if we're thinking about sociopolitical, it could be the historical experience. It could be mistrust. It could be fear. If we're thinking about cultural, the cultural context, it could be spirituality, language, means of communication, how people want to hear about information, how they share information, attitudes, uh, resilience, strategies that, uh, that people have. And then most definitely equivalence of measures. Not only can we translate it, but does, do the concepts translate? Are they uh, of normative value? Is that the type of things that, 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 that's talked about? With network con uh, context, we think about familial, family identity, uh, and especially extended family. And then finally with personal, we think about awareness, acceptance, and access. All of those influence the presence or the absence and the utilization of different resources. We've had limited success with traditional approaches to meeting dietary needs among seniors and especially among vulnerable seniors. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Well, and this is by no means all, all of the reasons, but it's, it may give some explanation. One is there's been a top-down, one-size-fits-all and it just doesn't work in the community and it just doesn't work among, among, among uh, a number of the populations. Second, there's this, there's this attitude of deficit thinking. We approach things by the needs, how disadvantaged people are, without thinking about the assets and the strengths that they, that they bring. There's an unrecognized and unacknowledged cultural wealth, which includes cultural knowledge, skills, abilities, and contacts. Uh, program silos, how many of the programs speak to each other and think about how many of the programs really are engaged with, uh, with other uh, community organizations and community groups. I think one of the big one is we don't ask the seniors. We don't ask, we don't listen to them. We don't, we don't represent their voice. Every time I hear about collaborations, it's the same typical stakeholders, and I don't hear anyone say, we've included seniors. We've included folks who, are really, who, who uh, are really would benefit from programs. And then finally, there's been limited community, uh, limited community collaborations. Well, uh, in, in South Texas along the border, and we see this in a, in a lot of the other borders, there's really been some, uh, some, some ways of starting to approach this. And one has been engagement of promotors de salud, community health workers, community health representatives, depending on the population. And here are some of the reasons why. They're better, they come from the community. They're respected by the community. They're trusted by the community. And they really can help identify community problems and solutions. They also serve as cultural brokers. So the link between programs, between academics, and the community. They really serve as a sounding board and as a participant in determining that the materials that we use, the information that we provide is culturally responsive. It creates, they create an atmosphere of trust and of sharing. They're able to mentor other promotors 
other community health workers. They, they provide invaluable observational insights and, envir and environmental knowledge. Promotors have been key to the work that we've done in South Texas. They've been key to our collaborators, uh, especially in, in Arizona. These are just, just a handful of the projects that we've done over the, over, over the past several years as they relate to seniors. We started with, uh, with a survey in two, in, in two communities in South Texas to get the resident perspective. We identified, uh, the promotors identified 140 seniors and they conducted surveys at the doorstep. That led to a community household and community resource uh, survey of 548, which then led to senior focus groups to where we assembled 14 focus groups in four different areas in, in the county with 95 participants to really understand food access, food availability, what's needed, modes of communication from their perspective. We followed that with a senior hunger survey of 578, uh, 578 eight seniors, and, and that also included a household food inventory to where we were really looking at what appliances were available. Did they work? What type of refrigeration did they have? What temperatures were the refrigerators at? So we think about not just the access to food, but how about the access to safe food? And, uh, and then finally, we, uh, we identified our REACH Progresso, which was funded through CDC, which was really a way of promotors engaging community residents and community stakeholders in coming together with a community health advisory committee to identify uh, community-wide or population change. So what have we identified uh, fr from this work. Just to give you a sample of the magnitude, uh, education, among all those surveys that we've conducted, we've got about 77% of the senior population with less than a seventh grade education. Greater than 92% speak Spanish only. Uh, for better than 90% country of birth was Mexico. In greater than 25% of the families, it was a female headed household. Uh, this was a point that Craig just recently brought up. Poverty, it's not just how much are below the poverty level because that number is 95%. It's to what degree. And we have better than half that are less than 50% of the poverty level, the federal poverty level. Nutrition assistance programs, when we look at SNAP, participation is about 54% among this population. There's lifespan food insecurity. And it's food insecurity that they began experiencing as children, and it has carried through through their life. There is also resilience, and this is kind of the uh, inner resources or social competencies and cultural strategies that help them to survive, recover, thrive, and enhance functioning. And then finally, uh, which, which I didn't put on there, is participation in senior meals. And there's about 12%, very low participation. And there may be a variety of reasons. It could be no senior centers close by. It could be any of a variety of, any of, a variety of reasons. But that has really uh, led us to start thinking about, especially when we look at the large numbers of, uh, of uh, food insecurity and especially of hunger, and we look at this, as Craig pointed out, we're seeing the same or greater among those who are 50 to 59 year olds as we're finding with 60 and above. So it's telling us we really, like he said, pay attention. We really need to pay attention to some of those, some of those lower numbers, lower ages. So from all of this, we found that we, we identified a need. And the need was to develop sustainable training and education activities to reduce the risk and presence of hunger using community collaborations that integrate place services and population health. So the idea here was how do you improve not only knowledge, but skills in the context of where people live. So what, who was key to this was the AARP Foundation, which through their Drive to End Hunger Initiative, uh, we pilot tested a program that we developed called No Mas Hambre, or No More Hunger, which was, as we identify here, an innovative promotora driven nutrition education and skill building curriculum that was delivered in the home and targeted the context of uh, of, of the home in which, in, uh, in which seniors live. And, and, and really, the reason for this is we kind of stepped back and we looked at how are people getting nutrition education and skill building. Well, if we look at the extension model, 
we have people who are bringing, bringing numbers in to a central location, going through the education, pre-test, post-test, they you know, improve knowledge, but nothing really changed. And what we figured out is what was going on is it totally ignored the context. How do you tailor this if they have limited cooking facilities, they only have a hot plate? How do you tailor this if the refrigeration is a cooler in the room? And so the idea behind this was to, uh, was to tailor it to the context in which the seniors live. So some of the short-term outcomes for the seniors, it was changes in knowledge and skills and food sourcing for a community. It was a greater awareness of food insecurity among seniors in the community. And it was increased knowledge and skills for promotoras. Uh, Midterm outcomes included uh, increased community linkages, uh, increased uh, community capacity for both promotoras and community partners, uh, and identify and empower seniors at risk for food insecurity. And I think that was one of the most things, the, the, the seniors felt empowered. Uh, uh, and, and with some, somewhat control over their, over their destiny. So some of the conclusions are seniors are key in identifying the issues regarding food acquisition and food preparation with knowledge and skills needed to reduce food insecurity and prevent hunger. The focus group discussions that we conducted provided the venue for seniors to explore and talk about their individual experiences, to share information among themselves as a group and to determine potential community and individual-based strategies. And, and then finally, to understand contextual opportunities and barriers that are key for increasing the knowledge and skills of seniors. As far as knowledge gaps and research pri priorities, uh, we've identified one is taking a lifespan perspective. Uh, the second is non-charity approaches. We've got to do more than just the typical, uh, the, uh, the typical type of solutions that we've thought about in the past. Solutions must engage community residents. They must be part, part of the solution. Uh, coexisting and collaborating uh, programs, and then most, and then most definitely uh, community engagement. Uh, final closing thoughts. Community prevention requires the engagement of traditional and non-traditional partners. Uh, we've got to consider, we should consider continuous improvement at multiple levels, that individuals and community have assets, not just needs. And then finally, uh, empowerment of community coalitions may be key with the empowerment of uh, promotors they salute, community health workers, uh, community health representatives. Thank you very much. Um, we welcome two questions from the audience. Yes. Oh. Um, SNAP participation, SNAP participation in uh, these communities was uh, hovered around 50 percent, I think, um, which is, is low, but maybe not as low as I would have expected. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Have there been outreach in those communities? There, or? there has definitely been outreach. The one number that I didn't talk about was how long do benefits last? And you have for, if I remember the number, it's about 40% about it's one week or less. And uh, so it's then thinking about the adequacy because uh, as, as uh, Craig pointed out, you know, there may be folks in, within the household who are not covered under SNAP because maybe they're not permanently within the, within the household and it, and it takes resources. I kind of think about uh, one, of the, one, of, uh, one of the participants from one of our uh, projects, it was a participant observation project, and uh, it was definitely a food insecure house. And uh, a situation came up where the mother was talking to one of our promotors and said, listen, I don't know what to do. I have a 16-year-old son and I have a 9-year-old son. My 16-year-old son, I really am afraid that he'll get into gangs and it'll be a bad influence on the nine-year-old. So I told my son that after school, you have to come home. And he said, okay, I will, but I wanna have some of my friends come over. Well, what do 16-year-old boys do? They eat. So here's a woman who's on kind of the horns of the dilemma that says, okay, I've got limited food resources within the home, but I wanna keep my, my child safe from the gangs and the influence it may have on other, ch on other children. 
And those are the kind of insights that, 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 that we've gotten with a lot of the observations and all that we've done that you would not have ever even thought about asking on a survey. Or at least I wouldn't have thought about asking it on a survey. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. That was an outstanding presentation. I really appreciate it. In particular, you're mentioning the uh, idea of assets in addition to needs. And since you are running away, <laughs> and, and I, I think it's um, a point worth highlighting, I, I wonder if you could give us some ideas of how, from a research and or policy perspective, we can work with that concept of assets. Because I feel like a lot of our uh, survey questions, the way we approach research, it's easier to find associations when you're looking for bad things. Uh, and then from a policy perspective, we set up a lot of things based on needs, basis, or um, income eligibility, or what have you. And so it, it, frame, it, it drives the conversation uh, in that direction. Well, I, I, I think from, from our perspective, we're, we're, we're so much more on the ground than we are at the, you know, what, what I would say the 30,000 foot level with the big policy. So we're thinking about, okay, how do we adapt things and how do we tailor things to individual uh, situations? And so our promotoras are engaging people within a conversation and they're identifying not only some of the strengths but maybe some of the barriers and can tailor what we're doing uh, to those strengths. One of the big strengths that we've identified in, in, in the community is people love to share information. Uh, as part of our uh, USDA project now, we're conducting children's platicas. These are uh, discussions, not focus groups, but discussions. Okay, so these are children seven to 11 years old. We have them in two de developmental groups, seven to nine and then uh, 10 and 11. Well, I thought that as long as we were keeping the kids in, this dis in these discussions and other activities for about two, hour two hours, we needed to do something for the mothers. Not research oriented, but some kind of mom's activity, okay? And so during, during the second session, uh, we did, uh, uh, a couple of my graduate students created this board game. It's similar to Monopoly and Candyland, where it's they're kind of going through the grocery store and they pull cards with different kinds of situations that you encounter. You know, you know, you've got a specific item that you want to buy, but you've got a coupon for something else, but you've got to buy three of those, and 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 you know, all different types of scenarios and figuring out, figuring out what to do. The mothers not only like that kind of activity but they took copies of that and shared it with their family and shared it with their neighbors. You know, as, as, as a hands-on activity, it was, was uh, working with them on making a healthy version of tostados. And so those kind of recipes, you know, they came back the following and said, oh, I made this for my family. Oh, I made this for my, my neighbor. So I think it's recognizing, I think one of the big assets is community and its neighborhood and it is family. And, and I think it's recognizing it and really, and, and really being able to, 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 to capitalize that. Because I think, you know, at, at, at this point, we, you know, we've gotten to the point where you can go all day long and find associations with all different kinds of things that we do in research. What the community wants to know is, so what? How are you gonna make a difference? And, and I think that's really the point that we've gotten within the work that we've done. We've done, we've done that other stuff. We have a responsibility to the community and the responsibility is how do we help them and build on their strengths and, 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 and help them have a better, better situation. Great, thank you, thank you. very much.